Hello and welcome to the Japan Archives, a podcast where we'll be delving into the histories and mythologies from Japan's long history. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co-host, Heather. We'll also be reading a poem for you every week and giving a little history about the poet who wrote it. Ikimashou! Welcome to the Japan Archives, episode 29. So today, I am looking at Thomas, who is a little bit under the weather. How are you, Thomas? Um, I'm here. That's, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm here, and I'm ready for your story today. My suspicion is Thomas is trying to come down with, um, I hope not flu, I hope just a cold, a very simple, fast-acting cold. But... Yeah, so we were already planning for for me to do the hosting duties today, so it turned out to be perfect timing, as Thomas might be a little quieter than usual. Thomas, gambarimas. Thank you. Uh, so, what is uh, the topic that you want to talk about today? Well, Thomas, I have a question for you. When you think of Japan and you think of alcohol, what comes to mind? Oh, my go-to would be sake, obviously, because that's the most most famous thing I'd hmm. say about Japan. Is there rice wine? So is that about is that what today is? Today is not about sake, or you're probably thinking about nihonshu, which is the the most popular um, form of sake. Okay. Today is actually about whiskey. Okay. So, but whiskey is Scottish. It is indeed, and. The subject of today's story is a woman from Scotland. Okay, so I'm intrigued. Well, like I said, you probably don't think about whiskey when you think of Japan, but did you know that a few years ago, Japan, the Nikko whiskey, actually won an award and beat out Scottish whiskey in a tasting competition not that long ago. There is a brewery in Hokkaido that um, named Nika, and it has their roots in Scotland. And so today, I will tell you the story of how Japanese whiskey came to be. Okay, I look forward to it. Now, usually when people talk about whiskey in Japan, you're going to talk about Masataka Taketsuru. I'm actually going to look at it from his wife's perspective. His wife was named Jessie Roberta Cowan and she was Scottish. She was born December 14th, 1896, in Kirkintilloch, East Dunbartonshire, in Scotland. Okay. Her father was a doctor in the village. She grew up the oldest of four children, two younger sisters and a brother. It's said that Rita, as she was called, had a happy childhood, but her fiancé died during the Great War, World War I, and her father died in 1918, and this brought on more difficult times. The family was in danger of losing their home, so they decided to open up to lodgers, and with that entered Masataka Taketsuru. Masataka was from Hiroshima, and he had come to Scotland in order to take back the secrets of Scottish whiskey to make in Japan. So why was there this sudden want for whiskey in Japan? So, good question. Traditionally, the sake in Japan, or Nihonshu, was the brewed rice. However, It was around the turn of the century that European uh, alcohol became more common in Japan. Things like brandies and cognacs, they were also being produced in Japan because people had developed a taste for these. However, whiskey was incredibly hard to reproduce. They couldn't get the recipe quite right because there are so many different methods into brewing whiskey. And honestly, I'm not even that familiar with them, but I do know it's it's more complicated. I think brandy is an easier thing to replicate. So they had a taste for whiskey, but you know it can get kind of expensive importing in, especially uh, back in those days. I imagine that whiskey had a long journey to get to Japan, so they wanted to be able to brew it themselves. So Masataka was actually sent from his company, but he wanted to himself also learn how to brew whiskey. He enrolled in the University of Glasgow, which just happened to be close by Kirkintilloch. And the reason why he moved in with the Cowan family is because the sister Ella attended university with him 
And she also wanted Masataka to teach their younger brother judo. Okay, that's kind of a sweet thing, I think. Yeah, definitely interesting uh, coincidence. Uh, all of these things that just fell into place. He just happened to go to Glasgow. He just happened to meet Ella, and they just happened to need someone to move in. And he also mm. did martial arts as well. So the judo uh, aspect to it, everything kind of fell into place. Okay, I see. Uh, d did you say what company he worked for? Or did I miss that? He was working in 1923. He was working with a place that eventually came Suntory. But I think before that, he was with a different beverage company. So a lot of the things I have is based on her. The thing is, Nika was his company that started actually like 1930 something. So that wasn't even around. That wasn't even a blip on the map. And it was not Asahi. Asahi was later on. You know, Thomas, I'm not quite sure about his company because when I was doing my research, I was focusing more on Rita and less about Masataka. There is a lot of information about him. But today, I, I kind of want to tell it from Rita, Rita's perspective. Um, and it's, it's possible that the company he worked for could have been a smaller company that was overtaken by one of the largest ones. Um, it also could have been one that he was working for that eventually became Suntory. But at the turn of the century, the bigger names weren't quite as big as they are now or even around. Okay, fair enough. I will allow you to continue then. And you might wonder, so why... What happened? Like Rita and Masataka, maybe they didn't have a lot in common. Maybe they did, but you know, obviously Masataka had to have a pretty high level of English fluency to be able to come and study at a Scottish university. By some accounts, Rita and Masataka fell in love during a singing of Old Lang Syne. Some accounts say it was a Christmas pudding with a ring and a sixpence that led them to believe their future was with each other. And Thomas, a question for you: uh, What's a sixpence? It's a denomination of money but what is it so the sixpence was a denomination of english money uh, which lasted until around the 1980 and basically it was called a sixpence because it was worth six pennies and in england 100 pennies make a one pound coin um so yeah this was a coin that was worth basically six one pence pieces so i like to think it was two people who recognize a beautiful spirit in each other two people who worked hard and had a future dream and realized that together they could probably probably make anything happen but i'm a little bit of a romantic so rita and masataka were married january 1920. now also being a romantic i wish i could have said that their families were happy and supportive and glad for the marriage However, both families were against it, and Rita's mother even requested that the marriage be annulled. Did they give their reasons for this? Well, I think there is some, there are some biographies about Rita that might have more information about that. But from some of the research I've done, there's a, a few different things that possibly could have affected it. A, they're both from different countries. They're going to be living in either Scotland or Japan, although Masataka had every intention of going back to Japan to take the whiskey knowledge with him, so that meant Rita was going to be leaving her home, and with the travel back then it was pretty hard and took a long time to, in order to get back for visits, and something that might have been impossible to do. Also, inter international marriage was not always seen as a positive thing you have the cultural differences and the language differences that during this time there's a, a lot of history that goes behind that and it's not something we're going to get into at this moment but traditionally it's not always seen as it was always seen as a positive thing so from rita's family side they didn't want her i'm sure did not want her to leave and move to japan and maybe never see them again and then from masataka's side they maybe would have preferred that he had married a Japanese woman. They might have had someone in mind for him, or they might have wanted to go through the process. Um, there was like mar different kind of um, ways to get married in Japan, especially the turn of the century. Um, sometimes the parents had a really active process in deciding your future spouse, and they might have had someone already in mind for him. And plus, they would not have wanted to have, they did not want to have a lady who is not Japanese in their family. Okay, thank you. Rita and Masataka stayed together and then moved back to Japan. So he had been sent to learn about whiskey and to bring back the knowledge and know-how, but 
when he returned, the economy wasn't doing so well and the company decided to change directions. Um, from my research, it was said that they wanted to have more fruity and kind of fun alcoholic beverages and not the you know, very serious uh, whiskey that he had, in they had intended. Things had changed, the economy changed, they wanted to make a lot more money quickly. Masataka, disappointed with the direction and not giving up, wanting to give up his dreams of making whiskey, resigned from the company. He did eventually find other work. However, Rita supported her husband. She taught English and she taught piano lessons. And she also worked diligently to study Japanese. She learned to cook Japanese food and even took to wearing kimono. To, uh, she tried her best to adapt to her new homeland. So even while Masataka resigned from his company, did not have work, she worked hard to support him and she stayed with him through all of that. And it's really interesting that even back in the early 1900s that teaching English was quite a common occupation back then. It seems to have lasted for a long time. It did. I found that really interesting. But 1923, Masataka started a new job with the founder of Suntory, but he left again in 1929 due to creative differences. It said that um, he, there were some disagreements and eventually he was demoted to a warehouse position. So again, Masataka was without work, but he decided it was time to open up his own whiskey brewery and decided on Yoichi in Hokkaido. The climate, the landscape, and the temperature was really similar to Scotland and he knew it would lend itself to a nice whiskey and he felt that the environment was a very important part of the process. Hmm. Okay. Now, Rita, I think she had been teaching English for a while. Rita had been teaching the wife of a businessman who invested in companies. So Rita had the connection with someone who then invested in Masataka's brewery. So due to Rita's teaching and Rita's support, she was able to help him get the capital to actually start his brewery. Without Rita, he might not have been able to get the funds enough funds to start that brewery. Oh, I see. Well, they moved to Yoichi in Hokkaido. And an interesting thing I found is that Rita had been working on her Japanese for years. And by all accounts, she was very good, very fluent. And even though her Japanese was like on a native level, very uh, conversationally fluent, I think even her writing was fantastic. She had picked up a strong Kansai accent. And when she first met the staff in Hokkaido, they found her really difficult to understand. So Rita and Masataka had their life together in Yoichi. However, I haven't, I haven't mentioned children yet. Well, unfortunately, Rita and Masataka were not able to have children on their own. During the course of my research, uh, I read that perhaps Rita may have suffered a miscarriage, but I was so I'm trying to find where I read that, but it was somewhere in some of my studies. So I've, I've got to go back and find that source. But I did find out they adopted a daughter named Rima. So they adopted a Japanese girl. And also because they wanted to have someone to pass their company on to, they decided to adopt their nephew. And their nephew at this time was in his 20s, I believe, so that he could take over the family business. So happily... Rita and Masataka did have children, and they had grandchildren as well. It's said that Rita was a kind yet strict grandmother, and she gave out sweets and candies and cookies, but she made sure that her children and grandchildren, and actually pretty much any child she ran into, made sure they spoke proper polite Japanese to their elders. And in fact, there's even a nursery school named after Rita, and she also taught there. And actually she started the nursery school. So she had the nursery school, the English teaching, she taught piano. She was a very talented woman, cooking, um, Japanese, very, very, she did so many things. It's really amazing. So I can kind of imagine just based on what I've read at her, she was a very, like, uh, very interesting person, very bright and intelligent, kind, but very firm guidelines, very firm and strict on certain things. but. A lot of fun loving too. I, I would have definitely liked to have met her, I think. Now, the brewery was, so, okay. Now the brewery had a little bit of hard time making money. And also, 
I'm not very familiar with whiskey, but I know it takes a long time to brew. While the whiskey was getting prepared, the company Masataka started made apple juice products. So they started their company with fruit juice whilst they were still in the process of making their first whiskey batches. Yes, they had a company un- named under Dai Nippon Kaju, and Kaju means like、uh, fruit, like fruit trees. So it kind of meant the Great Japanese Juice Company. Okay. The juice, with the how the whiskey was being prepared, they had to make money somehow. So they went with apples, which, considering、uh, especially Aomori's close by, the the climate lends itself pretty well for making、uh, for producing apples up in the far far north. Now the company、uh, so was doing okay. It was okay, so so. But、um, when they finally had their whiskey, which was released released in 1940, and the name was called Nikka Whiskey, which was shortened from Nippon Kaju, which was the name of the Apple Company. So they did it as like a homage to basically the items that helped them survive until they made their whiskey. Mm, exactly. Now the whiskey was doing、uh, okay, but you know, you realize that I I mentioned 1940. Well, it was around this time that World War II was going on, and sanctions had been made against imports from many countries, and the UK happened to be one of them. That meant no whiskey could be imported. But there was a growing taste for whiskey in Japan, and especially in the military. The brewery itself became classified as a vital required operation, and was given access to e- ingredients that were being rationed. So, due to this fact, the brewery was able to turn a profit in the mid 1940s. So, the brewery is doing great, making a profit, doing well. However, you might wonder what happened to Rita during this time, as someone who was from Scotland. She was not so lucky. She was looked at as a potential spy. She'd previously been welcomed and. Treated as just as an equal, as someone who worked hard for her community, who helped teach the children, who helped make sure the children <laughs> behaved, but also was really caring and kind. She was starting to be looked at as a potential spy. She became mocked. I read somewhere that children threw rocks at her, feared, shunned by her neighbors. They wouldn't talk to her. She was even followed by the police, who suspected her of working for the enemy. Even following her to. Visit Masataka, where she delivered his lunch to him. Lunch to him at the brewery, and also even I think they had an antenna for I think the television or antenna for something, and they suspected her of trying to communicate with the enemy. So there was possible they could even like try to raid her house while she was there. So the mistrust from her neighbors and her community had had to have been a heavy burden to bear. But she stayed strong. She kept her head up and continued on with her life. After the war, life settled back down. Things became more normal. The brewery had a good profit. Sales continued to increase, and Rita and Masataka lived happily for a while. However, in 1961, Rita died from liver disease. She was 64 years old. Masataka would outlive his wife for another 18 years.、Oh. Yeah,、um, I read an account somewhere that said that he was unable to go to her funeral and instead requested that her Her ashes be brought back to him in his room so that they could be together. And yeah, it, eighteen years, <laughs> much much longer time. So they'd had a happy life together, but unfortunately, it was cut short. However, Rita's story has not been forgotten. There's a Rita Road in Yoichi, and there was even a few years ago a daily drama, or it's called Asodora, on NHK that told a sort of version of her story. And I started watching the, actually,、uh, we started watching the DVD and got through the first DVD. And it's it is really interesting. Definitely, they show a lot of perhaps how Rita's life could have been. Definitely a little bit over dramatized because it is a daily morning drama. But some of the distress from Masataka's family, I am sure, over dramatized because drama. And I also found out there is a Rita, Ta- Rita Taketsuru fan club that makes the journey to her grave every year. Which, she, since she died in January in Hokkaido, is not an easy journey. So, like a pilgrimage of sorts. Exactly. Exactly.、Mm. And there's also the nursery that is named after Rita as well in Yoichi. 
Still there to this day. Still there to this day. And that is the story of Rita Takitsuru. And I, when I was doing the research, I got a lot of information from a lot of different websites. And if you want to read more about Rita's life, which I definitely encourage you to, because it's it's really an amazing story. She's really an amazing, amazing person and very admirable. I mean, the more I read about her, the more she just was so, it was just wonderful and inspirational. And especially as, as someone who is married to a Japanese man as well, it was really nice for me to read and to experience kind of some things she went through so I definitely encourage you to read all of these websites and to look more and do more research into her life. I think it was nice that you told this story from, like you said, from Rita's side, uh, as opposed to her husband. Which he's an amazing person and he also deserves to have his story told, but a lot of people have told his story because he is the founder of Nico Whiskey. Ah, sorry, I interjected, Go, keep going. <laughs> no, 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 I, I agree with what you said. Um, well, like you said, all of this does kind of revolve around what eventually became like his company and how whiskey came to Japan. But like you said, I wouldn't I wouldn't have known or realized that in a way we owe it to Rita, like you said, because she gained the connections that were needed. She integrated herself into Japanese society so well that she could support her husband while he was out of work and while he was trying to figure out ways to move on with the projects he wanted so it's nice to hear about Japanese history from no it's nice to hear about Japanese history and how people from outside of Japan have also contributed to the history of the country as a whole so yeah thank you you're welcome yeah I one of the things that I, I truly love about this story is that the two of them really worked hard and supported and loved and trusted each other so much. And it's just it's just a wonderful story to read about these two people who did everything they could to support each other and believed in their dreams and what they could accomplish. Mm, exactly. So Thomas, that is my story for today. And I'm going to turn it over to you to please read a poem. How do you know it's a poem? Are you going to surprise me? No, it's a poem. I'm delighted. <laughs> I am happy. <laughs> Both would be good. Oh, and speaking of poem and song, we had a slight snow flurry today. Oh, you had a little bit of snow, but it didn't settle, oh, I no, guess. It, it was a flurry. It was like maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds of like, is that snow? And that was it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's a shame. Well, no, I guess... No, I was fine. I was going to have to drive home in it, so I was glad it didn't do anything. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, in northern Japan, they're used to snow, so the roads are better prepared, and so are the cars. But, like, down here, if it suddenly snows, it's a bit of a nightmare. Mm. Like, in when I used to live up in Iwate, like, when winter was coming, like, everyone would go and get their tires changed to winter tires, because, like, all year you would have like an extra set of tires in your house just lying around waiting for winter. Whereas here, because it's so rare that it happens, like no one has them. Mm. So when it does snow, like the roads are horrible. Like you can't really drive that safely. Um, you can put the chains on your wheels, but a lot of people say they're not that safe to use. Or like they make driving your car actually a lot more difficult than if you just put winter tires on. But yeah, anyway. So a little bit about uh, today's poet. So um, this man we know was born in Iga province, which now would be Mie prefecture. And he was born in 1644 as the son of a man known as Yozaimon. And as he grew up, this man eventually had six different siblings. Gro growing up, this man was known as uh, Kinsaku, um, but after he did the coming of age ceremony, he had several other names such as Chuemon and Toshichiro. And yeah, uh, as he, as this child was uh, growing up as a youth, he was a companion to one of the local, he was a companion to one of the sons of the local lords, as his father at the time was one of the minor samurai of the Todo family. And so through his father and his connections to the local lord, his son became friends with the local lord's son and together they grew up and they also started to work on poetry together and eventually um, after this child grew up um, he eventually became known as Basho. Ah, oh, 
I see where we're going. So I wasn't intending to find a Basho poem, but it's like you said maybe last week or the week before. Basho, as he is one of the more famous poets in Japan now, he it's a lot easier to find poems by him than other poets. But I was trying to find a poem, not necessarily about whiskey, because I wasn't sure if there would be one specifically on whiskey. So I tried to find one just on alcohol instead. Hmm. And searching around online, I came across this specific one and I liked it. And it was only afterwards I had chosen this that I realized once more it was another Basho poem. So, Thomas, I guess what you're saying is many roads for us lead to Basho. They certainly do, Heather. <laughs> so, as I am doing the poem today, it is your job to have your pen and paper handy as. It is for everyone else at home if people have started playing along themselves. This specific poem is a is one of the ones we have become used to, so we're into the five seven five syllabary. Syllabary? 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 Um syllabary. And yes, this one is about alcohol. So if you're ready, um, I will attempt to say this in my best Japanese. Kanpai. Sake no meba. Itodo nerare ne. Yoru no yuki. Now, obviously, my、um, timing of the poem is not as good as you, because you're more of an expert now at reading the poetry. No, I'm not, but thank you. <laughs> so,、um, so, what do you think you heard? Well, first of all, I liked your reading. I thought it was very good. You should be confident, but that's my first thing. And I believe I understood something about. Like、drinking sake, and if you can't sleep and snow at night. Your Japanese is a lot better than mine. You basically figured out the entire meaning of the poem. Oh! So, the first one, so sake no meba, we can translate to as I drink my sake. So, itodo nerare ne, sleep eludes me still. Yoro no yuki, on this snow swept night.、Mm. So, as I drink my wine, sleep eludes me still. On this snow swept night. So, actually, you were spot on basically with the whole thing. Wow! <laughs> I, I am surprised. See, I told you you read it really well. It was really, and you, I know you know those words too. You would have guessed the meaning. I know you would have. I, I, I know most of those words, but it was the bit I struggled on saying really quick was the nerare ne, because that's written as one word in the poem. So, nerare ne. Was where I was stumbling around. So, yes, I apologize for that part of the poem. <laughs> But no, I'm super impressed. You got the whole thing pretty much. I am super happy that you got a poem about drinking and snow and, and winter. This is great. <laughs> exactly. It's very themed to all these past weeks. We have the theme of today, we have the theme of snow, going back to your song. And it's also a Basho poem, so three in one for people today. And like I said, it was purely by chance.、Um, I was just looking for one about alcohol, but it just happened to also have elements of winter. And it was by our number one poet. We do love Basho. I, I think we, we definitely, he's, he, if he's in our top, he is definitely going to be in our top maybe three. He has to be. I think so.、Mm. Um, well, like I said, my favorite has always been Oh No No. Mm. So I'm glad. Well, I'm assuming you like the poem.、I、As you said, poem. it was,、mm-hmm. it hits so many different things we've been talking about these past weeks. Yes, I love the poem. That was fantastic. Thank you for finding it. <laughs> You're welcome.、Um, so, yeah, that was my little poem for today. It's actually nice sometimes when we do this role reversal, like me trying to see your side of the show, trying to find interesting poems and stuff like that. And you having to do like, The whole, a whole story. The whole story, introduction, and yeah, it's definitely different from, from this side and how much, like, how much pressure and, and things, especially early on. I can see like, the evolution of how things have gone from your side and how you can do now because I'm, I'm still at the beginning stages where you were at months ago. So I'm still, I'm still teething my way up to. A greater competency. <laughs> well, I still think it was an interesting episode. So,、Yay. well done, Heather. Thank you. Thank you, too, Thank you all for today. Well, Thomas, since we have told our poem and we have told our story, 
I am guessing that is all for today. I think so. Um, so if you're ready to take us out, Heather, I'm ready. I am indeed. And thank you to everyone who tunes in every week to listen or tunes in occasionally to listen. Thank you so much. We so appreciate that. And we're glad that you come and join us. Please, if you get a chance, please rate and review us on your podcast app of choice. Please, thank you and so much. And we hope to see you again soon. Matane. Okay, guys. Speak to you next week. Matane. If you've enjoyed the Japan archives, please consider checking out historyofjapan.co.uk, a database we are making on Japanese history. You can also find the show notes for all our episodes here. If you're on Instagram, you can follow my account over at nexus underscore travels. That's N-E-X-U-S underscore travels. We also have a Facebook and Twitter page, which you can find at Japan Archives. If you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at heatheroveryonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to historyofjapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Thank you again for listening, guys. Until next time. Bye. Matane.